All right, let's get going today. So the AP Physics 1 exam is almost upon us. Um, it's tomorrow uh, at 3 o'clock Central Time. Uh, make sure that you log in by 2.30. They want you to log in 30 minutes before exam time. And that's just to verify your ID and fill out some demographic type information. The way you're going to log in is you should have already received uh, an e-ticket. And that e-ticket should have come to you via email. It will have a link on it for getting to the test platform. If you didn't get that e-ticket through your email, you need to log in to my AP. So you can log in right here at this URL and you'll be able to find your e-ticket there. Copy will be there for you to use. Haven't heard of anybody having a hard time getting the e-ticket via either email or my AP. Um, one of those methods should definitely work for you. All right, I want to talk about some things that you need to make sure you have available to you on exam day. Number one, you need to know your AP ID number. This is going to be on your e-ticket, so you can get it from there. You also can log in to my AP again, and you can get that number there. That AP ID number will need to either be written or typed. Uh, along with your initials at the top of each page of your answers. So make sure you put that number at the very top. Uh, I would put it in a header if you're typing. And if you're just deciding to do the handwritten approach, just write it on the top of each page. I'd go ahead and do that today. Go ahead and get some paper, put your APID, put your initials on the top of each page. Some other things that you're going to need for the exam are the AP formula sheet. Make sure you have a hard copy of that. I would print it out and have a hard copy. If you don't have access to a printer, use the digital version. But you want, to, if, if possible, a printed hard copy. The same goes for the A plus flipping physics reference uh, or what we're calling the cheat sheet. I would recommend a printed hard copy. And again, I know some of you probably can't print. You can use the digital version. That is fine to do on the test. Uh, but those two documents, those are the things that I want to, I would want to have handy on exam day, along with um, a calculator and plenty of scratch paper. If they're either one of the documents up at the top, the formula sheet or the, the cheat sheet that you need copies of, feel free to email me at this email address right here. And I'll send you copies of them so that you have them um, to use for the exam. So, but again, if possible, Hard copy of the formula sheet, hard copy of the reference or cheat sheet. Uh, we're going to be looking at both of those a little bit later in this session today, making sure that you know what's on there and where things are at. All right. Any questions so far? Any questions about when the test is, how to get there, that kind of stuff? All right, so let's talk a bit about the timing on the exam. As I said before, you need to log in 30 minutes before start time. Make sure you get in there in plenty of time. There'll be a timer on the screen that shows you when the exam is going to start. Um, once it starts, the first question is going to automatically appear on the screen. Uh, and you'll, you'll get a timer for that. That first timer is going to show 30 minutes. That's 25 minutes for you to do your work and then five minutes for you to submit your answers. Um, when that timer gets to five minutes, it's going to put up an alert. Um, at that point, I would recommend that you go ahead and stop working and start submitting. Uh, in the first couple of days of AP exams, there have been a few submission problems. So I want to talk to you a little bit about those submission problems and how to avoid them. Number one, update your browser on your computer. I would recommend that you have the newest version of Google Chrome. That's the browser you need to use, but make sure that you've updated it. Um, if you're on a Mac, you can get Google Chrome. Safari would probably be okay on a Mac, but if you're using a PC, the newest version of Google Chrome, download that, install it if you haven't already. Make sure you've updated it. 
Also, don't wait until the last minute. Um, people who've had problems have been people who've been waiting till the last like 20 or 30 seconds to submit and things haven't worked out so good for them. Give yourself plenty of time. It sounds like there's going to be separate submission buttons for questions that have multiple parts, like a part A, part B, part C, part D. So I would go ahead when you finish part A on a question, go ahead and submit part A. Sounds like there's going to be separate submission buttons for those parts. Um, same for part B, same for part C. Now, if there's only one submission button for the whole question, don't hit that until you're finished. But if there are separate submission buttons for each part, you can go ahead and submit those separately. Um, it sounds like the easiest way to, to take this test is to top up your answer in either Word or, um, or Google Chrome and just paste your answers into the actual test uh, exam box. That sounds like the, the, the method of submission that's causing the least problems. We'll talk about the other methods in a few minutes about how you can turn in your answers but that sounds like the best one. Once you've submitted your final answer, you should get a confirmation message. It said something like, congratulations for submitting your answers. Do not close your browser. Do not leave the testing website until you get that message. If you don't get that message, you're gonna need to take the retake. Um, this URL down at the bottom will let you request a, re a makeup test for any tech issues you have. I think if you update your browser, you give yourself plenty of time to, to submit, you won't have any problems, but I've heard of a few issues where people have had, had issues. So make sure you have the newest version of Chrome, give yourself plenty of time to submit. Um, and if you have problems, request the makeup exam. You only have 48 hours to request that makeup exam. So go to the URL, request it as soon as you have a problem. One other thing I'll mention, if you have any add-ons, um, like the Grammarly app, for example, on your computer, uh, you wanna turn off those extensions or add-ons, just disable them, remove them if you can, um, just to make sure you don't have any problems. And if you haven't already done it, the AP folks have set up an exam demo. You need to go to this demo right here and try it out. This will let you test to make sure that your computer is gonna work. Um, it will allow you to submit some answers, just some made up, just some made up questions. Um, you need to try to submit your answers on this demo in the format that you plan to use for the test. If you plan to copy and paste your answers into their text box, try that method. If you plan to upload a Word doc or um, a Google doc, try that method. If you plan to work, work out on paper and submit pictures, try that method. If the picture method is your approach, be careful. This, the pictures need to be submitted as JPEG or PNG files. Your iPhone, your, um, your iPad may be set to take pictures in this format. This format is not compatible um, with the College Board's testing uh, setup. I've sent out directions to teachers two or three times about how to change phones to uh, the J JPEG format. Um, if you don't know how to do that, either email your teacher or email me, and I'll send you directions for making sure that you have your phone set up the right way. Point being, if you don't submit your answers for each part by the time that timer is up, you're not going to get any points. So save time. You may not finish this test. That's okay. There may be parts of it you never get to. That's okay. Make sure you submit your answers to the parts that you do get done. At least save yourself two or three minutes to do that. And again, any technical issues, if you don't get the confirmation message at the end of the test, request the makeup. Also, Make sure that after you submitted your answers, even if you got that confirmation email, to check to check your email every every um, every few hours for the next couple of days. I've heard of one or two situations where a student submitted their files correctly, and then the College Board couldn't open them up. The files were corrupted, so they emailed the student and told them that the student needed to request a makeup exam. 
So check your email, make sure you don't get one of those messages. I don't think that will be a problem for any of you guys, but just in case, check your email regularly for the next couple of days after you submit your exam. Any questions? Can we use Google Drive to submit an answer? All right, so a little bit about the test format. You're gonna have two questions. Question one um, is gonna count for 60% of the test grade. It's gonna be what they call a qualitative, quantitative translation problem. You know, qualitative essentially means something in words and quantitative something in like numbers, mathematical. So these questions are gonna have you jump between describing things in words and describing, describing things in numbers or equations. Uh, we're gonna look at an example question in a minute. Um, but again, going between words and math and describing and analyzing a situation. You're gonna be asked to work with multiple representations. A lot of the example problems that I've seen lately have you to evaluate um, the opinions or the writing of students or scientists. Um, and again, some of these may be mathematical, some may be narrative like paragraphs, um, some may be graphs, some may be diagrams. You're not gonna have to draw a graph, but I think there's a good chance you might have to evaluate a graph or a chart. So here's an example question for a QQT question. So this one's our old familiar um, modified Atwood machine. That's what they call a modified Atwood machine. And notice they describe um, two cases. Case one, where this weight is going down and it's essentially pulling the other block to the right. Case two, the block's been pushed or something and it is pulling up the other block. And then two students are describing what are happening. So here are their descriptions. And you're asked first to talk about what part of student X's reasoning is correct. So when you're answering this, make sure you only talk about student X and you only talk about what's correct about student X's answer or uh, description and why it's correct. You want to like you want to answer each part of this question separately. So this would be subpart I. You want to clearly label that. You want to answer only subpart I. Notice next what aspects of student X's reasoning are incorrect. Explain your answer. Before we get to that though, here's an example of what you might say on that first part. And notice it only takes about a sentence, maybe two. Student X correctly states that that both cases have the same hanging mass, the same force of friction, um, the same mass on the table and the same coefficient of friction, blah, blah, blah. So they're giving you different ways you could say it. But essentially, they don't have to say much. Part two, um, the forces between the two trials are not the same. In case one, the frictional force and the weight of the hanging block are in the same direction and result in a larger net force. This leads to a larger acceleration for case one. The tension on the string in case one is smaller since the acceleration is greater for the hanging block. All right, and then, then, then they go to Y. They wanna know what about what Y said is correct and why. And then finally, what did student Y say that was incorrect and why? and you get some example responses for both of those. So again, each part of this is probably not gonna take more than two or three sentences. You might have to derive a very simple kind of equation like this one, um, but they're not gonna be any complicated derivations of equations. Every equation that you're gonna have to derive is gonna be easily typed out on the computer. The typing approach is what I would recommend for you guys in terms of, of, of doing your answers. I wouldn't recommend to do it on paper and take a picture and submit the picture. I would recommend you can you can scribble it out on paper first if you need to type up your answer and submit it that way. 
And again, the equations that you're going to need to be dealing with are no more complicated than what you see here on my screen. But that's an example of question one. It's going to be the QQT question. You'll have, again, 25 minutes to answer, five minutes to submit your answers. Questions here. All right, question two is what we're calling the paragraph argument short answer question. So as it says here, the question type uh, is about assesses your ability to, to write a paragraph length response um, that coherently explains the physics given to you. Um, here's some, some basic uh, advice about these paragraph length responses. First of all, make sure it's coherent and that it uses the information given to you in the question. So you've got to talk about the information given to you in the prompt. That's important. Um, you know, in the past, AP physics has been about math and equations. And what the college board has found and people in colleges have found is sometimes folks that are really, really good at physics are not great at communicating. So they want to make sure that you're able to communicate in, um, in, in writing. So this is an important part. You've got to demonstrate that you can communicate your understanding in a reasoned expository analysis. And again, it's got to be coherent. It needs to be organized, sequential. Do it in order. It doesn't have to, to be overly long, short, to the point. You'll see, you'll hear me say this a minute again in a minute. I like to use the acronym ATP, address the prompt. Answer what the prompt tells you to answer. That's it. Don't do anything else. Don't go off on tangents. Address the prompt, be concise, move on. Here's an example paragraph style question. So I'll give you guys a minute to read through this one and kind of get an idea of what they might be asking you. But I will point out right there in a clear, coherent paragraph length response. So that's just one of many possible examples. Uh, oftentimes there's going to be a part A and a part B. Part A is going to ask you something short and sweet. You're not going to be asked to draw anything on the exam like this. In a lot of the example questions they've shown, it's about drawing a free body diagram. You're not going to be asked to draw a free body diagram, but they may very well ask you some questions about a free body diagram in part A and then part B has been the uh, actual, here's, here's the scenario, here's the paragraph response you have to give us. They might, may divide on the exam this into more than two parts. You may have an A, B, C, D. Um, just make sure that you do what the prompt tells you to do. That's important. So here are a few more tips for answering the questions. As I said before, address the prompt. Answer the question that's asked and only the question that's asked. Answer each subpart separately. If they don't give you labels for each subpart, like a part A, part B, part C, part D, make sure that you yourself clearly label each subpart's answers and only answer that subpart in that section of your test. Pay really close attention to what we call the task verbs. In each question, there are going to be some verbs that are in bold. These are words like um, describe, justify, derive. Those words are where the, your points come from on your exam. Make sure you pay very close attention to those words and you do what those words tell you to do. Very crucial. Make sure that you don't skip parts of the question. 
unless you just don't know it. Read carefully, answer everything you know. There may very well be parts of a question that you can't answer. And you got to realize that's okay. The exam's designed to be that way. If you don't know one part of a question, then it's fine to skip that part of the question. But don't stop. Go to the next part. You're probably going to be able to answer it. You can't give up. You got to have some grit on this exam and some determination. Um, answer everything you know. Don't give up because there's one part of the question you don't know how to answer. It's also important to remember that you get credit for the quality of your solutions and the explanations that you give. You can get partial credit. Partial credit is great. Um, show your work, especially if you have to derive an equation or work out a problem. Show every step. Also, over explain your answers. Make sure that it's clear um, to whoever's grading your paper what your logic is. If they tell you to justify, make sure that the person knows here's what I think and here's why I think it. Here's some evidence. Talk about your evidence. Be clear. Even if you get a correct mathematical answer without the supporting work, you're not going to get all the points. Show every step. That's critical. Also, make sure that you save again that last two or three minutes on each section for submission. Don't wait till the last 10 seconds to submit your answer. It's okay if you don't finish the whole test. It's likely that you won't finish the whole test. Make sure you submit answers for the parts you do have answers. All right, here are the different ways to submit your answers. Three different ways. This is the way that I am recommending you do it. I'm recommending that you type up your answers in Word or a Google Doc. And then when you're finished, copy that work and paste it into the, the box that will be in the exam um, window. Hit submit. That seems to be the method that uh, people have experienced the least amount of problems. You also can um, attach your work as a file. Um, if you're going to do that, you need to submit it as either a, a doc file, like a Word document, or a PDF. You can't just share a Google link. So you're going to have to download the Google Doc as a Word document or a PDF and then attach it that way. The other option is to take photos of uh, handwritten work. And again, that's okay, but make sure that the files you're submitting are a JPG or PNG files. Make sure that your camera is set not to save the files in this format. And again, if you need the directions for how to change your um, change your, your phone from this format to JPG or PNG, just email me or your teacher and we'll be glad to send you some easy directions. It'll take you all of about five seconds to change the setup of your phone. All right, any questions on the ways to submit your answers screen? All right, so one thing the College Board is being very, very picky about um, is they're looking for, for ways to prevent cheating on this exam. It's an open book, open notes test, but there are a few things you've got to avoid. So here are some do's and don'ts on the exam. Number one, you can use notes. You can use the cheat sheet. That's completely legal. You can also perform internet searches during the exam. I don't know how much that's going to help you, but it's legal. What you may not do is you may not confer with any other person by any other means during the exam. So this includes talking on the phone, using FaceTime. It includes a, like a chat room or text messages. I think where the most problems have happened so far is this right here. A lot of folks thought they could be clever and, and set up a shared Google Doc or a shared uh, Microsoft 365 Doc and type their answers into that document and then copy and paste them 
um, so that everybody in on the cheating ring could do that. Don't do that. They will catch you. They've already caught several people. Um, they threw out their exams. I think they reported them to the colleges they were going to. So that is not something you want to want to get involved in. Also, don't use um, social sites like Reddit or Facebook Live or something like that to try to set up a cheating ring. Not a good idea. Use your book. If you have a textbook, use your notes, use your cheat sheet, use the Internet. Don't use another person. That's crucial. Also, if your if your teacher has set up shared documents, like maybe um, student notes on Google Classroom or Canvas, if you plan to use those, I would recommend that you download them so you're not opening up anything that's shared. Because that's one of the things that the College Board folks are looking for, is they're looking for folks who are using shared documents, documents that could be edited by multiple people in real time. So anything that you're going to use, other than just like a Google search, I would recommend that you have it downloaded and on your computer so you can open it up from there. The College Board did send out a video about their rules for the exam. It's a, like a two or three minute video. It's very quick, easy watch. So if this is something you're pretty concerned about, I would recommend that you watch that video. Um, again, in order to be safe, in order to make sure you're not anywhere near the boundaries of the rules, whatever you're going to use, print it or download it onto your computer. Um, don't open any kind of shared documents during the exam. If you follow that advice, you're not going to have any problems. Questions? All right. So again, you want to have hard copies, if possible, of both the formula sheet and the cheat sheet. You want to be really, really familiar with both of those documents before you start the test. So I'm going to open up each one of them and just give you a quick run through of each one. And we'll start with the formula sheet. So here's the formula sheet. Notice you've got a section of um, constants and conversion factors. Um, I can't think of too many of these you would need other than uh, the universal gravitation constant might show up when you're dealing with um, Newton's law of universal gravitation. Coulomb's law won't play in this test because electricity is not included on this test. Uh, electron charge shouldn't play again because electricity is not included. I don't think any of this stuff over here will will uh, play either because most of those topics have been eliminated on this, this year's exam. They notice they include the acceleration due to gravity as 9.8, but you need to use 10 on the exam. Just use 10 meters per second square for acceleration due to gravity. The rest of the first part of the sheet here is just uh, abbreviations for different kinds of symbols. Um, prefixes for different uh, metric units. And also a little bit of trig. Remember, you can use a calculator and I would recommend you have one handy just in case. You're probably not going to need it much. Um, but if you need a sine or a cosine, you can come up with that on your computer. All right, so here are your equations. So a couple things to remember, the electricity section, you can mark that out. That will not show up on this year's exam. The waves section will not show up on this year's exam. So mainly we need to look at first here at the things on the left, the mechanics equations. So you've got your acceleration equations uh, at first. You've got Newton's second law right in here. Here's your equation for the frictional force, uh, the, the coefficient of friction times the normal force. Remember that on flat ground, that normal force is equal and opposite to the weight. Um, if you're on an incline, um, it's going to be a component of the weight. Uh, and you're usually going to find that component using um, the sine function. Here's the equation for the um, centripetal acceleration of an object. Remember that all the, the symbols are over here on the right. So if you don't know what a symbol stands for, you can figure it out over here. An equation that's not on this formula sheet that I would go ahead and add related to this one is I would go ahead and add um, 
my computer is not going to let me write on this screen, but I would add the equation for centripetal force. And that is FC, F subscript C equals M times V squared over R. FC equals M times V squared over R. And that's just another way of writing Newton's second law for things that are going in uh, circular motion. FC equals M V squared over R. Here's the equation for momentum. And this one, this one right here is essentially the impulse momentum equation. Impulse F delta T causes a change in momentum. Here's the equation for um, linear or translational uh, kinetic energy. Here's the essentially the idea of the uh, work energy theorem that a change in energy is caused by work. That work has to be parallel to the displacement. And this is just a way to calculate that work, FD cosine theta. That gives you the component of the force parallel to the displacement. Here's the equation for power, change in energy per unit of time. Here's some of your acceleration equations in, for rotational um, setups. Um, this equation right here will let you find the um, position of an object that's in like simple harmonic motion. So the position is equal to the amplitude, the larger displacement times the cosine of two times the frequency times the time. Going on down, um, alpha is angular acceleration. So this is essentially Newton's second law in terms of rotation. Angular acceleration is equal to the net torque over the moment of inertia. Next, you've got some equations for torque. Um, this equation right here is for um, angular momentum. Angular momentum is equal to the, um, uh, the uh, moment of inertia times the angular velocity. So that's essentially the same as P equals MV, uh, but for rotation. Here is a change in angular momentum is equal to the angular impulse, torque times time. So again, that's very similar to delta P equals F delta T. Here's rotational kinetic energy. So when things are rotating, like a wheel rolling down a hill, they have translational kinetic energy, one half mv squared, but they also have uh, rotational kinetic energy, one half i times uh, angular velocity squared. Here's Hooke's law for dealing with springs. So the restoring force is equal to the um, spring constant times the displacement. Here's the uh, elastic potential energy equation, like again in a spring, one half kx squared. Uh, and here's the density equation. Density equals mass over volume. Over here on the other side, you have some equations for, here, here the T stands for period. So this, this one right here, for example, is the period of an object on a spring, like a mass on a spring. That's related to the mass and the spring constant only. Here's the period of a pendulum, which is determined only by the length of the pendulum and the acceleration due to gravity, wherever that pendulum is at. The mass does not affect the period. Here's Newton's law of universal gravitation. Remembering that you have uh, G on the first page of this, uh, this guide. Scrolling on down, you've got some area formulas and volume formulas over here on the right. Can't see you needing those, but it does remind you about sine, cosine, and tangent and what those are. And that's the AP physics formula sheet. Pretty straightforward. Again, if you need a copy of this, a hard copy, email me at matt at a plus ala dot org, and I'll be glad to send you a digital copy. Questions on the formula sheet? All right, here is the what we're calling the cheat sheet, the flipping physics A plus uh, cheat sheet. This essentially has everything that's on the formula sheet with some more description. So if you get to a problem and you say, oh, I don't really remember how to do that, you can come to this cheat sheet and it'll give you a quick, a straightforward explanation for what they're asking for. So first it goes a little bit into vectors and scalars. 
how to find components. Then it goes into kinematics and it reminds you in these uh, different kinds of graphs you might have related to motion. For example, in a um, position time graph, the slope is velocity. Um, in a um, velocity time graph, the slope is acceleration. In an acceleration time graph, the area between the curve and the axis is the change in velocity. So just quick reminders. Scrolling on down a bit, you've got your acceleration equations. Some reminders about how to use those. Talks a bit about the center of mass and what that is. Inertial mass versus gravitational mass. Then he goes into Newton's laws, talks a bit about those. Some reminders about free body diagrams are included in here. He has a good section here on friction, talking about the differences between uh, static and kinetic friction and how that um, kinetic friction is always less than static friction. That's important to know. A little bit on Newton's third law. He talks a bit here about translational equilibrium at the bottom and that an object is in translational equilibrium if number one, it's at rest or number two, it's moving at a constant velocity. Essentially, that means there's no net force acting on it if it's in translational equilibrium. Moving on down, next he's got a, um, a section on the work energy theorem. He takes that equation off the formula sheet and then gives a good description about how you, you get the force parallel to the displacement. Um, he gives you the units for work. He talks about um, translational kinetic energy, different kinds of energy, elastic potential, gravitational potential energy, remind you that work and energy are scalars. Talks about mechanical energy. Now remember, mechanical energy is the kinetic and the potential energy in a system. It's conserved, assuming there's no friction or drag or anything like that. If there are friction or drag though, some of those energies can be converted into heat, light, or even sound due to the friction. So he goes through all that in the equation, a little section on power. Then he's got a little bit of information here on Hooke's law and how that works. A good section on momentum reminding you about the differences between elastic collisions and um, inelastic collisions and how that inelastic collisions, both momentum and kinetic energy are conserved. But in inelastic collisions, which are usually ones where things collide and stick together, momentum's conserved, but the kinetic energy is not. Some of that kinetic energy is lost due to light, heat, sound, and so on. He reminds you about the impulse equals change in kinetic energy equation, breaks it down and gives you some units here at the bottom. Next, he moves into rotation. So angular acceleration and the formulas for that. Angular velocity. He gives you all of the um, uniformly angularly accelerated motion equations. That was hard to say. Talks about centripetal force and centripetal acceleration. A little bit about uh, frequency and period. And then he goes into torque. Good explanation of torque. Um, a little bit about the uh, moment of inertia, I. He gives you different equations for I. He's got a good section here on um, rotational kinetic energy and this idea of rolling without slipping. If that's not a concept you're familiar with, I would take a minute and really look at this rolling without slipping section of the cheat sheet. Uh, a good explanation of angular momentum and how it works. Remember that it's conserved. Angular impulse. Then he has a section on gravity. And something that I've seen in a lot of cases is they've asked you to derive the equation for like the velocity of a satellite around a planet. He's already derived that equation for you. Uh oh, let's see if we can't make that bigger again.
So like in this equation here, he's derived that down to this, this R is the radius. So here he's saying this is the radius of the earth plus the altitude that an object is above the earth. All of that together corresponds to this R in the equation. So he's trying to explain that here. Here he's derived the equation for the velocity of an object um, going around a planet, like a satellite around a planet. He's got a good section on gravitational potential energy, the universal gravitational potential energy equation. And then finally, he has a section on simple harmonic motion with a good picture, good explanations. He derives out um, this equation for the position of an object at some time. And then he compares the graphs of something in simple harmonic motion, a position time graph, um, a velocity time graph, an acceleration time graph, and so on. And then the, the sheet ends with a reminder that if you need the period of an oscillator on a spring, that's determined by the mass and the spring constant. And if you need the period of a pendulum, that's determined by the length of the pendulum and the, um, the G, the acceleration due to gravity, where the object is at. So take, take yourself some time um, and familiar, familiarize yourself with both the formula sheet and the cheat sheet. One other um, piece of advice that I'll give you, I, I sent this out to teachers yesterday. The website fivable.com has what they're calling a crash course review session that's going on uh, today. It costs $5 for you to, to be part of it. Essentially, they have a two-hour crash course session where they go through all the units that are going to be tested today. They also have a section on uh, sample FRQs that they'll walk you through. And then they have sort of like a trivia game, review game at the end. So if you're, if you're feeling a little doubtful about where you're at on this exam and you want a last-minute cram session, fiveable.com. Uh, and again, it's a $5 crash course review session on AP Physics 1. I don't think you could go wrong there. The other thing that I would recommend that you do is go to either the A plus um, College Ready Science YouTube channel or go to the AP. Um, that's the College Board YouTube channel and watch some of those videos. There are videos on essentially every topic that might be tested. Just scroll through those. Find the topics you don't feel comfortable with and watch those videos today and hopefully that'll help. All right. Are there questions for me before we call it a day? All right. I want to thank all of you for your hard work um, during this pandemic. Um, a lot of you could have just stopped working and, and gave up, taken your A and moved on. Thanks for continuing to work. Thanks for continuing to want to do well on the exam. And I want to wish you and your teachers the best of luck. Uh, again, if there's anything I can help you with, you can email me at matt at a plus ala.org. Best of luck on the exam tomorrow. Um, I'm sure you're going to do well. Thank you guys for being here today.